Welcome everyone uh, back for another motiva Motivation Monday. Uh, I'm kind of in a haze. I think a lot of you are probably the same way of Christmas. So I hope you had a good Christmas. I tried to stay away from the office as much as I could and I didn't actually step foot in my office. There was one day where I came and sent out some shirts and hats, but I told myself I wasn't going to step in the office. So I'm glad to have taken some time off, but I'm, uh, I'm happy to be back at least for today. And then I'm going to take a couple more days off for the new year, especially thinking about the new year and what is coming. So today we're going to be discussing um, a little bit about the new year, but also your questions. So I have you submit these questions in my story. You'll probably see them there where you can uh, where you can submit a question. So if you go to my story, you'll see this question area where you can actually submit a question. I can put it on the screen and answer your question live here. So that's kind of the main format of what we do here. And I can share things on flight training topics, uh, aviation career topics, any technical topics you want to talk about, maneuvers, process of flight training, anything. Um, I'll tackle it. So uh, go ahead and put your questions there because then I can bring them up on the screen and it's really helpful for me to be able to do that. So I'm just going to start to go through here um, on your questions and answer those questions one by one. And as we are on the live stream here, you can again enter those questions into the story and I will prioritize those questions that are asked during the live stream okay so that probably means that you're here you're watching and so i try to answer your questions while you are actually here so let me start to go through and do that and you guys can kind of see what this is like um so i've had this question a couple times how do you pay back a student loan after taking one out for a private pilot license so really i guess the at the end of the day you just got to pay it off. Um, a lot of these loans that you get for flight training, you don't have to pay off until you're done with your flight training, just like another education loan where the interest doesn't start accruing until you are actually done with your training. Uh, that's not always the case. I, I myself wouldn't necessarily recommend getting a loan to get your private pilot license done because you don't really have a way to pay it back with the skill that you're um, using it for. So you know, if I, I don't know, I, I guess that's just like a personal money thing is I want to have a return on my investment and with getting it for your private pilot license, you're not going to be able to get a return on that license until you become a commercial pilot. So I'm not big on loans for private pilots, but if you do need to pay it back, um, at, you know, get a job, pay it back, that sort of thing. Uh, other than that, keep working toward your commercial license. I think that's the most prudent thing to do. All right, good question, got that answered. Looks like we have a couple new ones here. Um, so can a private pilot holder log hours toward a commercial pilot license and aircraft to use in commercial transport, but he only flies when it's empty? Is he allowed? So yeah, this is uh this is actually getting into part 135 or 121 versus part 91. And if there's an empty leg, often those flights are used as uh as part 91. So the whole set of rules changes and you may actually be able to log that time. You're just going to have to talk to the people that you are operating with, that you are flying with and see what they uh what their rules are cuz they'll know and they often do this. So yeah, just talk to them. It's usually a matter of um, just making sure you log the time correctly, everyone logs the time correctly, and adhering to the regulations. Again, if you guys need to ask a question, do that in my story. Sometimes there's a little um, question mark box here in the chat at the bottom, but you can't leave it in the comment box because I'm just focusing on answering questions. So go ahead and uh, do that for me if you would. Okay, let's see what is next here. Saw another new one come through. Is 35 too old to start training for commercial pilot license? I would expect to finish by 38 with a frozen ATPL and all ratings. Absolutely not. 35 is still fairly young to start your training. I know people that have gone through and gotten their ATPL at... Uh, 
at over 50 years old. So that would still offer you some time to have some fun in the industry. And, um, you, you know, you may not, you're not going to build the seniority like you would if you were there for decades, but it would still be a good situation. And I say it's kind of never too late to become a pilot. You get just got to keep working at it and you've got to start and actually do it at some point. Because typically what happens is people get to the point where they say, hey, is it too late? I'm 35. And then they get to the point, oh, hey, is it too late? I'm 40. Is it too late? I'm 45. At some point, you've got to buckle down and you've got to do it. You've just got to jump in and go because then that's your starting point. Otherwise, this question of is it too late? Is it too late? Is it too late? Just keeps coming up. So if you have a passion for it, you think you want to do it and all the uh, pieces are falling into place, just go for it. I don't see why you couldn't just go for it. All right. So good question and a common question because there are a lot of people that are looking to do a career switch. Let's see what's next here. This is actually a good question. Um, what is your opinion regarding automation in this industry? So in a lot of ways, I am a big proponent of automation because I think it offers a lot of safety, especially in single pilot operation when you are kind of relying on this electronic co-pilot with you to help you in um, in staying ahead of the airplane, in navigating, all those things, and then you kind of become a manager. I spent a lot of time doing that in a G1000 airplane, and I, I really enjoyed single pilot IFR when I was doing that. Now, things are moving down the road too, right? Because Garmin just announced their Autoland, um, emergency Autoland uh, technology, which will actually automatically land the airplane at a nearby airport. So that's a really interesting piece of tech that's coming along. And, uh, and we've seen automation over the years, you know, go from a, a three or four person crew in an airliner and bring us down to where we're at two. I think someday we could see it at one. I don't know when that's going to be, but I myself think that there's too much of a like a fear barrier with people to have pilots taken out of the airplane altogether. I think that people want a human to be able to have intervention in it. And uh, and still the technology is at a point where it's not 100% reliable. So we do need that intervention um, from the pilot. And we're, we're seeing that with what is going on with Boeing right now with the 737 MAX in that uh, there's some automated technology there behind the scenes that was fighting against the pilots and things went wrong and even trained pilots were having issues with it. So I think, uh, I think there's still a long way to go to totally eliminate pilots from the flight deck. I never say never, but I don't see it on my horizon. I don't see it uh, within several generations. I think we have to get rid of a general fear of flying before we do uh, before we have a fully automated airplane. So uh, that's what I think. All right. Again, if you guys need to ask any questions, make sure to do that in the uh, in the story because that's where I can bring the questions up on the screen as you're seeing here. Good question on automation there. Let's see what else we got here. Um, kind of a kind of a more of a personal question, but I think it's good for you guys to think about as well because we are coming into the new year and maybe it's uh, something I can bring up at the end of the stream here and ask you guys what your plans are for the new year but let's do that and I'll kind of read the comments at the very end so uh, this is from Fly Maui Hawaii from Leslie and John Cobble some friends of mine that that run a podcast they're really great what was your top flying experience in 2019 and what are you looking to in 2020 so I'd say my top flying experience was flying with my friend Josh, who came up to Alaska in June. We spent two and a half weeks together, flying all over the place, experiencing new things for me. I took him to places that I have known already, most of the places I knew already, but still some new and some fun experiences. And one of those experiences was flying above the Arctic Circle, which I'd never done before. And I wanted to go to a place called Bettles, which was very far off the beaten path. In fact, there was no path there. Literally, we took off from the airport. We were leaving and went to Bettles, and there were no signs of human life from there to Bettles on the path that we were on. So it was pretty amazing to be in Bettles above the Arctic Circle on the solstice, which means that the sun did not set at all. 
and we got to see that. It was two in the morning and you could still see the sun on the horizon is a pretty cool experience. Um, and so uh, lots of uh, growth experiences in between there as well, just traveling back and forth in Alaska. Um, so that was the uh, kind of the best flying time of the year for me. I had a great time at Oshkosh this year, just so much fun with my friends and also got a lot of great business things done. I was honored to be on different panels and things. And overall, I think the business just took a big leap and I'm excited about that. And for the new year, just more, kind of more of the same, but for me, I'm actually trying to grow my team, trying to do more of what I am good at, which is being on camera and teaching. So I am hiring an executive assistant. If you know anyone or you are yourself that kind of fits that bill, I'm looking for someone to help with business type stuff and communications and just organizing my business life. So if you know anyone, I have a, an opening for that. I'm going to be getting into advertising to grow the business more just so people are aware of my products and what I do and, uh, and you know, go to the regular shows. I'll be at Sun and Fun in Florida. I'll be down in California during the winter a little bit here in the next several months. I leave in a couple weeks. I will be in Salt Lake, Las Vegas, Texas, Florida, like I mentioned, back in Alaska for flying for the uh, Great Alaska Aviation Gathering, Valdez Stoll Competition, and lots of Alaska flying. Hope to help a handful of people through their ratings this summer. Might have a guy in the next few weeks to help them through a CFI. So I'm just constantly working on things and all along trying to produce content to do that and that's my plan for the new year and always offering you guys new stuff and just staying consistent with things like the podcast, doing new things like this Motivation Monday uh, or Q&A Monday is another title I thought for it this morning. Anyway, it's a it's an uphill climb. You know, I, I'm, I'm trying to make a name for myself in the industry and uh, and it's working. It's just slow. And so you guys are kind of my warriors out there to tell people about my products and what I do. And when someone needs a ground school, send them to me. When someone needs check right prep, send them to me. That helps me do more of what I do. And the more I can grow the business, the the more of this type of stuff that you're seeing I can do. So I'm uh, I'm working to grow my business in that way. Okay, great question. Thanks, Leslie. And we will talk about all of you guys and your um, your New Year goals here at the end of the chat. Here's a question. Would you recommend getting IFR after getting PPL and how long after? So pretty good question and a common question. Um, yes, definitely. I think that if you can afford it and you want to do it and you think that um, the IFR flying might be in your future, and even if it isn't, IFR is a good idea. I had someone tell me, um, actually, I, I, I know who he is, uh, Crossland Aviation, you can look him up. He told me when I was asking about IFR and why it's important, and he said that it's not that you use your instrument ticket to get into situations, you use your instrument ticket to get out of situations. And I thought that was a really good perspective. So it's just this different safety layer that you have as a pilot to get out of things. Now, as you become more of a professional pilot or, or even if you do want to delve into getting into weather as an instrument pilot, I think that's completely appropriate. Not saying that you just use it as a, you know, get out of a situation sort of ticket, but um, I think you can definitely fly an instrument. It's some of the most challenging, fun, beautiful type of flying. Flying in the clouds, clipping along at several hundred miles per hour is just really really cool and especially if you're doing it by yourself as a single pilot it's just an experience you can't really replicate so it's hard as a vfr pilot to understand that but it is very rewarding and it takes a lot of work so to your question of starting ifr you have to build 50 hours of cross country time for your instrument rating and so that's one thing you can focus on right away now the time that you use toward your instrument if you are doing cross countries, that can count toward the 50 hours. But what you need to realize about the instrument rating is that it takes a lot of extra mental work to learn about this system, this air traffic system. Uh, so take your time with the study component. I would say as your mind is sharp in the mode of study and learning in aviation, starting right after your private pilot is a pretty good idea. But start on ground school and just start to chew through all of that information that you're going through. 
Uh, we do have a ground school here at Angle of Attack. You can find it at angleofattack.com. I'm really proud of it. I've done a lot of instrument flying myself, and I feel like as long as you can keep the big picture in, AV, in instrument flying and then come back to flying the procedures well and the knowledge of how that works, you can be a pretty good instrument pilot and understand it well and, and really grasp it well. So I tried to structure my course that way, and I'm really proud of it. So getting started on the ground school right away after, I think is a big thing regardless of where you go because it takes time to understand instrument. The mental component of instrument is the biggest part. The actual flying part of it isn't really, really in the conversation at all. There's just so much information to learn and applying that information to the flying way more than what you experience in, in private pilot. So that is my advice is get into the ground school right away, get that out of the way. And then once you're ready with that, then you can start to delve into the actual flying component with your instructor and maybe you dip your toes in the water a little bit to add some context to what you're learning in uh, in your ground school but i think that's a good place to start is ground school and then into the cross-country training all right great question again if you guys need to ask a question do that in my story because in my story you'll find the actual question box where you can enter it and then i can bring it up here on the screen you're welcome, uh, Light Chop Maintenance, I guess, is what you're, Light Chop MX. Let's see what new questions we had here. So recommendation on 121 versus 135 versus 91 straight out of a 141 school. So lots of numbers there. Um, let me just explain very quickly what those numbers are. So. 121 and 135 and 91 are different types of commercial operations. There are different sets of law that govern what happens in those operations. And it's, it's like a completely different set of rules. So 121 would be your scheduled airline service. 135 would be unscheduled or charter. And then 91 is going to be personal use, corporate, that sort of thing. And then a 141 school, which is separate from all this, is a government regulated uh, training program. So something like a university that has uh, like a curriculum that's very structured and you know, they, they do it differently than just a regular curriculum. So your question of recommendation on 121 versus 35, 135 and versus 91, I don't think it really matters what you do. I think uh, after you get out of your 141 school, you're gonna have to build some time. And I think honestly, if you could dip your toes in the water in every single one of them and uh, and find out what you actually like, what really you enjoy in aviation, I think it could surprise you that it might not be what you always thought it was. Because for me, when I originally wanted to become a pilot, I wanted to become an airline pilot, which would be part 121. I saw airplanes flying over our home all growing up, and that's part of the way I, I knew I loved aviation and latched onto it. And they were Delta airplanes. I wanted to be a Delta airline captain, right? And I wanted to fly international. That's what I wanted to do. But as I got into aviation more and started to, I guess, grow even as an adult, I found out that I wanted to um, focus on family more. I wanted to live in a place that I loved. I have a lot of creative aspects to my talents, <clears throat> like making videos and doing photography. Um, I'm an entrepreneur at heart. I'm ambitious in that sense and <clears throat> and creative and I, I'm always doing all sorts of things. So being an airline pilot really didn't fit me. And so as I moved into the industry more, I found out that I wanted to be an instructor and I wanted to share all of this stuff online and I wanted to make a difference in that way. And so that's how I shaped my career. So my advice to you would be don't just pigeon your whole, your, pigeonhole yourself into one thing. Dip your toe in the waters of different stuff, take the jobs that come, be willing to move around. And I think you'll, if nothing else, you're going to have fun along the way until you finally find that job that you wanted to have. So even if that is an airline pilot, which is a fantastic career, you get to the point where you're an airline pilot and you have a bunch of stories of when you were an instructor or when you did charter work or whatever, okay? So you have all these different experiences that you'll appreciate and that will add to your repertoire. 
All right, so that is my advice on um, 121 versus 135 versus 91 commercial operations. All right, thanks for the question, Chris. And if you guys need to ask a question, you can do it in my story. You'll have to leave this and go back to my story. There's a little question box there where you can ask, uh, ask a question. I can actually pull it up on the screen and show people that way. So it's just more helpful for me to keep track. This is a question that came up yesterday. When purchasing our first aircraft, what should we look for aside from price and hours? Just really quick off the top of my head, but I want to finish this off with a huge piece of advice is an airplane that has a low TBO or, or not a lot of hours on the engine um, or since major overhaul, I guess it'd be. So typically TBO is in the 1500 to 1700 hour range and you're, you're going to want to find a low time engine, but you also don't want to fly an airplane that's just been sitting around for a long time. So often you'll find these low, our engines on airplanes that have basically flown 200 hours in the last 20 years, which is not good. A sitting airplane is not a healthy airplane. Um, there are a lot of gotchas, okay? And, and this whole aircraft ownership and maintenance and everything is just, it's a whole rat's nest of things that can go wrong. Um, I had a friend or have a friend, Cameron, who has a beautiful, beautiful airplane. It's a, I think it's a 1983 172P, which is uh, one of the best 172 models. And my advice to him, I actually handed him off to this guy that does aircraft pre-buys, was, hey, you know, do it right and, and make sure that you do the due diligence on the airplane before you buy it because it can be such a hole if you don't, a hole for your money. And he went through a, a couple times of some airplanes that just did not go well. Um, they uncovered some things that, that were sketchy um, and he moved on and he eventually found something that just worked perfect. It's been the perfect airplane. And I think a lot of times we get emotionally involved with this airplane that we think is gonna be the one and we wanna buy it. And I think you gotta take your emotions out of it and just make sure that you are doing your due diligence with something like a pre-buy from someone that knows what they're talking about and knows what they're doing. I think these guys that I recommend, I think they even have a podcast called The Pre-Buy Guys, um, could have that wrong, but uh, his name is Don Sebastian. He does a lot of great work with that. He'll even travel to the airplane and check everything out, or they'll do it over Skype with the aircraft owner. So there's lots of different ways to do it, but do your due diligence. You could really get in some big trouble if you don't do it that way. So I know some of the things to look for, but I'm also not the expert, so um, that's what you gotta do. All right, let's find some other questions here. Is three hours a week a good rate for training? Um, I'm assuming you mean like three lessons, and I think it is. Yeah, I, I think uh, like Monday, Wednesday, Friday, three times a week is actually a really good pace. You'll probably do a little bit more than three hours um, even if you do two flights at one and a half hours, that's also a good pace. You need time to process it in between and you need time to study in between. Think about what's going on, let it settle in, but you also don't want it to be so spread out that you forget what you have done in your lessons. And so we're always fighting with this, uh, this recency thing in flight training where we want to have done the recent flight training but we don't want it to be so intensive and recent that we can't absorb the information. So it, it all depends on who you are, but the rate at which you absorb that information is very important for you to know and then making sure you pace it out so you have time in between to study things. Otherwise, you might be wasting money doing too much flying or You'll, you'll be wasting money doing too little flying. And what I be, mean by that is if you're flying too much, you don't have time to process what's going on in between. If you fly too little, then your brain has processed it, but then it starts to forget it. So yeah, three hours a week is a pretty good rate for training. And a lot of that goes to affordability as well. Scariest moment involving student error. And 
you know, this is something where I haven't had a lot of scary moments with students. I think I'm a pretty relaxed person. Um, I, I have good confidence in the airplane and my abilities to control it. I have confidence in taking over. Um, haven't really gotten in a situation that's been really bad. So I don't know. I, I think at the end of the day, um, what I want students to avoid is complacency. I think they need to avoid like the, the thought of not necessarily forgetting things because I think we're all human and that's what checklists are made for and, and different checks and balances that we have. But we need to, <clears throat> we meaning instructors and students and making sure it takes place. We need to make sure that people don't get too focused on on the minutia of things that they forget the big picture and end up making a mistake that way. So I'm a big picture type of instructor and uh, and not a lot of things scare me. I, you know, I've had instances where I've had to take over or, or I've hit prop wash from a plane, but it really hasn't been that bad. So I think to a certain extent as you get, as you become more of a professional pilot, You've seen a lot of things. Everything slows down even more. I think that's definitely a threshold you cross, cross as an instructor. And so a lot of times, actually, I'll let things go beyond where the student is comfortable controlling the airplane, and I'm still not uncomfortable. And that's where they will learn a whole lot. So I, I think just understanding that learning process is also important in it. But I haven't really had any scary moments, and so you know, I, I don't have too many war stories as an instructor. All right, guys, if you need to ask a question, again, please do it within the story because in the story, I can actually bring it up on the screen and that way others can ask or see it. So eat, play, lift. You ask a question, if you can put that in the chat or yeah, in my story, that would be helpful. So Noah Andrew, what's your job when you don't fly? So actually, I don't, I'm not super busy flying all the time. I, I kind of split my time between flying and, and filming, even a lot of those experiences, and then creating online courses. And so angleofattack.com, if you guys go there, that's my username. If you go there, you'll notice that I have online ground school, I have check ride preparation, I do podcasts, I do um, Instagram and things to build my business. So I'm actually, building a, a, a larger picture here with what I'm doing and not just one-on-one -on -one instruction, but I feel like they're all hand in hand because I feel like there are organizations out there that, uh, that do online ground school and things like that, but I'm not sure they're actually active instructors. In fact, I know many of them aren't. And I always want to stay active with the community, one-on-one -on -one with people and know their challenges. And I feel like it goes both ways, right? So if I am teaching real students, which I do, then I can take those experiences over to the online ground school courses that I do, the check ride preparation courses that I do, and uh, and that will serve you, the community, so much better than if I was just a video guy. So uh, that's kind of my MO is, is a lot of both. I live in a small town, so having my economy be bigger than just a small town is really important to me, and uh, and that's been working really well for me. So this is my job. This is what I do. This is, uh, this is angle of attack is my baby. I've had this business for 13 years. So a little bit of a creative twist on my aviation career. Uh, John from the Bahamas. Hello. Good to see you. It's been a long time since I've known you. I, I know who you are. All right. Let's see what else we got here. Let's see. Let's see what else we got. Here's a question that came up yesterday. What is the best way to gain a tailwheel endorsement? So a tailwheel airplane is, they were kind of the original airplanes that were, were released and they do fly differently, especially on takeoff and landing. They fly quite a bit different, um, or rather maybe not so much fly different, but there's less room for mistakes and you have to really be on the money. 
So my advice for a telewheel endorsement is go to someone that's really good at it and go to someone that knows what they're doing. Um, there are a lot of experts out there that have been flying tailwheel their whole lives and they just know how to teach it. And so that's what I did. I went to a place in Texas and really enjoyed it. Um, Burnett, Texas, north of Austin. Um, plenty of places here in Alaska. It's kind of funny. I didn't do it in Alaska since I'm from here, but uh, it the opportunity popped up and I had a friend that was fantastic at it. And so I didn't feel like I was getting short change at all. But plenty of places in Alaska to do tail wheel uh, if you're visiting. And, you know, I think you just got to go with someone that knows what they're doing. And at the end of the day, it's funny because tail wheel is boiled down into some very simple concepts and sayings that can help you help you do it. So I know I know it's a, it's a fun experience. They're fun airplanes to fly. They, they open up a whole lot of other opportunities. And so definitely go out, reach out, find uh, find a place that specializes in it. And that's the best thing to do. All right, guys, again, if you need to ask a question, please do that in the story where I have the little question box. You'll see my questions there. Um, would you ever consider writing a book? Absolutely. I think at some point that's going to be in the cards. A lot of my content already could be turned into a book. So I think I could find a way to do that. But I always have kind of these thoughts popping up. Um, However, you know, I, I do try to focus on those things that I feel are fitting today's media world. So content that you can absorb in just a few minutes or content you can absorb while you're doing something else. Like many of you may be listening to this while you're actually working or preparing lunch or something. And uh, we're just more and more busy. And so I'm trying to find those pieces of content that work more toward that. But definitely, I think that a book would be in the future or several books. Just not yet. Not quite there yet. Again, that's why I'm hiring people so I can free up my time. So George um, asks, just started instrument training. Any good study habits you can advise? I think just having a, like a re religious, almost religious routine for your study habit is really important. So for me, when I was going through a lot of study for my advanced ratings, I had a newborn and I just had to make it very clear to my family that there were certain times I needed to study. And that was like a sacred time where I had to be doing that and I needed the blessing of my family to be able to do that. So set up a schedule first and foremost and start to go through that and then have fun with it. I mean, for me, I think one of the big reasons I've started this business and and why I've been doing it now for over a decade, uh, 13 years again, um, is I feel like there's so much more improvement we can have in the aviation industry just to make flight training fun and make the absorption of new information fun. And even digging back into the past and finding out those things that used to be taught that maybe aren't anymore that could help us because I feel like so much gets lost as we keep adding things on like learning avionics or or all of these distractions to the core principles of what makes a great aviator. So I'm very passionate about restoring a lot of that knowledge, but also sharing it in a fun way. So just have fun with it. Find those sources that are fun. Um, there's no reason why you can't have fun with it. But be serious about the schedule you're keeping and then just start to work through the information. And step by step, you'll get there until one day it's pretty amazing. We all become pilots and or it's possible for all of us to become pilots. I wish you all could become pilots, but it's all predicated on how much work you actually put in. You know, it's up to you. It's the step by step day to day of committing to that training schedule and just going through it piece by piece. You'll have to come back and go over some information, but eventually you're just going to be there and you're going to be ready to take the test. And that's how it works out at aviation. You just got to keep chugging away. So it, whether it's instrument or private pilot or commercial, whatever it is, that's my advice is get into the material, have fun with it and try to enjoy it. And that can go to even you end up getting into YouTube videos or whatever, you know, just Keep it fun. Keep it fresh. All right. Let's see what questions we have here. Mm 
favorism. Let's see, I'm gonna answer this one. Um, advice for a student pilot to perform so he can get his first solo. I think to a certain extent as a, as a student pilot, everyone needs to get over this hump of confidence. And so you need to end up finding the confidence that says, hey, I deserve to fly this airplane solo and not be so apprehensive about everything you're doing because you're learning the lessons and your instructor is telling you what to do. So do it. Like, you know how to do the gumps checklist. You know how to do the checklist and run the checklist. You know how to keep your speed on final. You know how to flare. Just, just do it and try not to think as much. When you can get to the point where you're not thinking through things as much and they just become more natural, that's when the skills really start to show through and where you can actually build the skill. So that's my advice is, is that's the point you've really got to get to. And for a lot of people, that's an emotional barrier. I think there's a lot of psychology that goes involved, is involved. I think it can even get into crazy stuff like how your parents treated you when you were young. I mean, I know that sounds pretty off in left field, but there's a lot of stuff that goes on when people are learning to fly and it, and, uh, and the cool thing is, is that as you overcome those, you kind of grow as a person. So anyway, yeah, try to build the confidence to actually do that. Your instructor is going to know when you're ready and that's how it all works. So I know that's a, a really simplified way of saying it, but that's just my point of view. What can I say? Let's see. Do do. Let's see here. Eat, play, lift has been answering some good questions. What's the best learning path for someone interested mostly in backcountry flying? This goes back to what I was talking about with your tail wheel is you need to find someone that's experienced, right? You need to find someone that knows what they're doing that can uh, show you the intricacies of doing that, how to set up, how to evaluate your landing locations. And it really is 100% dependent on like a mentor, not necessarily even an instructor, but like a, a mentor. So someone that can guide you through that process. So for me, I actually haven't been getting into a lot of backcountry flying yet because I just don't have the airplane to do it. Um, so for me, it's still a new thing. And my dream someday is to have a Super Cub to be able to explore the mountains here more, the lakes here more. And when I do that, I absolutely know I need to get someone with local knowledge to come with me and fly with me and and guide me through that process. Even at the level I'm at, if I am at any level, um, I, I try not to take my pride too much into my flying. I try to stay humble no matter where I'm at. I always want to be teachable. And so that's the perspective I come from is I want to find someone that's really good at it someone that's a good teacher, someone that can really stretch me. And maybe it's not just one person, maybe it's a handful of different people that can teach me those topics and how to do that. Um, I've, you know, I've delved in it here and there, and I can say that it 100% helps my flying everywhere else. And so I'm a big proponent of learning to do those things, uh, but no matter what it is in aviation, you wanna go to someone that is good at it. and. And Instagram, where we're at now, is a fantastic place to do that. You see so many different corners of aviation here that you can just reach out to people, direct message them that you know are, are doing these types of flying that you want to do, regardless of what it is, and just start to ask them on where to go and what to do because there's, there's little niche pockets of aviation that we don't know too much about. For example, I want to do some glider stuff. I don't really know anybody, and so I need to find out who those people are or maybe for you it's backcountry, or maybe it's float flying, or maybe it's uh, multi-engine flying, or maybe it's IFR, whatever it is, direct message those people and just use the social component of social media to actually talk to somebody and, uh, and find that out. But yeah, find a mentor. That's the biggest thing, no matter what you're doing, is find a mentor. Okay, good question. Close that one out now. Uh, this is an interesting question, um, but it looks like the question got cut off as well, but I think I understand the gist of it. 
Do you have any personal minimums for signing a student off for a check ride? A certain number of flights to ACS standard, for example. Um, yeah, I. For me, they definitely have to be meeting the ACS standards. That's for sure. Um, but I want to see the biggest thing I want to see in a check ride is not that like every skill they have is perfect because I don't think that's possible at 40 hours speaking of private pilot or even instrument. I don't necessarily want to see that their skills are perfect, but I want to see that they're going to be safe and think through everything. I don't want to send them to a check ride if they're not going to pass a certain skill. But what I'm saying is that, that I'm not trying to get them to a level of perfection. I'm trying to get them to a level of proficiency and then I want them to have the big picture of whatever license they're working on. So I think part of the issue with, with the ACS or, or maybe more so the PTS, which came before, was a lot of the training we do as pilots is maneuver based and it's not so focused on the big picture or scenario based. In the ACS or the Airman Certification Standards, they do want you to keep a bigger picture, uh, you know, uh, of what you're doing and, and where you're going and how that could devolve into a bad situation or how to fix that situation. So those are the type of critical thinking skills I want to see in a student. It's not so much that they can perfectly control the airplane. They're going to be pretty dang good at it when they go to their license, but I want to see that they can keep the big picture that if they get overwhelmed, they can bring themselves back and focus on the basics and get control of the airplane again. So that's really where I'm coming from when I uh, when I pass a student off for whatever it is, and I I think it 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 takes people it takes people back a little bit because they want to go in absolutely perfect, and I will see a lot more perfection in their decision making and want to send them, and they're not so comfortable. And I think that's kind of how it goes sometimes as instructors see the big picture a little better because they've been through this many times. Whereas a student kind of focuses on the one thing that they may not be perfect at, whereas everything else is good. So the big picture, critical thinking, aeronautical decision-making, whatever other acronym you want to use for it, that is what I want in a student. And that's what I want to see them performing when they go to the check ride. And incidentally enough, that's the big picture that the FAA wants to see. Yes, they have standards that they test you on that can sometimes be specific down to the, the degree of heading and the amount of speed and all that stuff. But at the end of the day, they want to see that you're going to be safe. That's why this entire process exists for pilots is they are they're trying to um, keep the public safe. And that's why they have all these barriers in between. That's why this government agency exists to do that. So that's my personal minimums and also helpful for you to know that perspective of what you should be looking for when you're going for your license. All right, so to get to my story, you'll have to leave, or to ask a question, you'll have to leave this. You'll have to go back to my um, profile, click on my profile image and you'll see my stories there and then you can ask a question in my story that I can then bring up on the screen here. Take a quick drink here while I'm pulling up the other question. Hmm. Here's kind of a random question. Uh, would you recommend starting flight training on a non-tower or on a towered airport? And it doesn't matter. One way or another, eventually you're going to have to learn both disciplines and both have their pros and cons. I don't think that one really outmatches the other in difficulty. So let me give you a quick example. So a non-towered airport, all the communications are going to be up to the uh, the pilot flying. So. You're not gonna have anyone controlling the situation. They're not going to be organizing the communications. It's going to be up to you to determine who's out there, what's going on, you looking for traffic, all of those things. That's a pretty difficult thing to learn and a critical thing to learn. And I feel like a lot more can go wrong at a non-towered airport than at a towered airport. 
Now, moving to a tower to report. The difficulty there is communication. So at the end of the day, people are, are a little bit apprehensive of talking on the radio, saying the wrong thing, getting in trouble, not saying it fast enough, whatever it is. And so there's some apprehension talking to air traffic control. And that's what it boils down to. Take some time. You have to find out how to roll the words off your tongue as you're quickly going through. You have to understand or learn how to understand the fast radio chatter. So there is a there is a whole lot to learn on both ends of it, but I think at the end of the day, they both kind of balance out in their difficulty and you're going to have to learn both of them anyway. So you may as well um, go that direction, whatever it is, just start out wherever makes the most sense. And I wouldn't determine where you're going to do your training based on towered or non-towered. I would do it based on the quality of the flight school and whether or not you get along with an instructor. I would rather you go to the busiest class Bravo airport in the world and learn there than go to the smallest airport where no one ever flies and using an instructor that isn't good. So it actually boils down to the quality of the flight school and the instructors, not the airport. A good instructor will teach you how to use all of it, okay, and, and do it well. So that's my advice there. Okay, again, yes, please ask your questions in the question box in my stories and I'll bring those up. This question comes up all the time. What's better, going to aviation college for an ATPL or just a local flight school? So I actually did a whole podcast on this subject. It's called Part 141 versus Part 61. I can't pull up the podcast number right now, but if you go to aviatorcast.com, that'll redirect to uh, the podcast. Uh, you can find it on YouTube. You can find it on um, it, basically any podcast platform, iTunes, Spotify, all those. But the gist of it is 141 versus 61. And I go through the pros and cons there of what's good versus the other. Uh, at the end of the day, it just kind of depends. These larger aviation colleges or 141 schools can have really good financing and that can help you get through the whole program. Uh, often it's kids teaching kids and so you have young instructors teaching young students. Those instructors don't necessarily have a lot of experience um, and that can lend to some issues sometimes. They may not even be passionate about what they're doing and so they may not be the best teachers. And then part 61, uh, you know, it could be hard getting financing. Um, the flight school may not be as organized. So there are a bunch of different pros and cons, but at the end of the day, go to the one that works. I'm not a huge fan, I'll say this. I'm not a huge fan of the aviation colleges that charge an exorbitant amount of money and at the end of the day, you basically get the same result if it's part 141 or versus 61. So I don't want you going to a college to get $300,000 in debt just because they'll let you, uh, they'll loan you the money. There are way better ways to do that without putting yourself in a bad financial situation. And so that's my advice there is, it kind of depends first of all on what works best and then you know, be be diligent about your future. Don't just put yourself in a ton of debt because you can find the best, most efficient and, and most affordable way to do it. So I hope that's helpful. I know that's kind of big picture, but one isn't necessarily better than the other in the result you get at the end. And so that's why I am a proponent of, I guess, um, just whatever works best for you, what's in your local town, who your best, who the best instructor is, who the best school is, and, and what works for your situation. So be creative about it, and, and that's all I can really say. I've done a mixture of both. I did my private 141, I talked about this in the podcast, and I did other ratings 161, so I've seen both worlds, and had great experiences at both places, so it really just depends. Good question. All right, Let's see what else we got here. Let's see. Take another drink of water.
Really random question. Favorite plane to fly? A 172 is my current favorite plane to fly, but I love, uh, I love lots of planes. You know, I've flown a probably, gosh, I don't know, maybe a dozen different air types of airplanes. And it's cool and challenging to fly different planes, but right now I'm just loving the 172. It's a great training platform and I'm happy about it. And I, I'm just kind of a content person anyway. So I'm pretty happy with where I'm at. Let's see. Uh, what to do? Sorry for the pause. Just trying to find one I want to answer next. Okay, do, 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 do. I already covered that one. I, I guess I'll talk about this one. We're kind of winding down here. So how does a how does a VFR pilot utilize the Victor Airways? Just pop in the VOR and line up on the correct radio. That's pretty much it. Is uh, typically the the airways are VOR to VOR. You're flying away from one VOR as you have reception on that one, and then you're eventually crossing over into the next VOR to get reception on that one. And and yeah, that's what you're doing. Victor Airways are are meant for kind of these highways in the sky, these corridors in which we fly. But with the advent of GPS, they're becoming less of a critical thing for people to fly on. And a lot of what we do nowadays is, is direct GPS flying or we're kind of a different route of GPS flying. And even with uh, four flight, flight planning, you can put in a fairly complex flight plan path um, that's even you know a, a, like a, a pilotage or dead reckoning path. And then you can send that to the FAA and they'll get your exact flight path and your flight plan um, rather than doing just big Victor airwaves when really you're actually going around a corner or doing something else. So that's kind of helpful. Um, but yeah, Victor airwaves, that's essentially what they are. Looks like some new questions popped up here. So let me um, let me see what we got here. Just close this quick and I'll start to wind down now. I've been at it for about an hour now. This is a good question and yes, it is true. So um, Jacob Walther asks, is it true that employers would prefer Alaska hours over other standard hours? And yes, it is a thing. I think it's more of an insurance thing and sometimes it's not even an insurance thing. It's more of hey, we want to know that you know how to fly here in Alaska. And so if you have an employment opportunity in Alaska, you actually having an Alaska time is a big thing. Um, it's, not, it's not a deal breaker at the end of the day. There are plenty of other um, caveats to that and, and different ways that you can get around it. But um, yeah, it, it is looked upon in a positive way to have Alaska hours. But where do a lot of Alaska pilots come from? They come from outside the state. We wouldn't really be able to feed all of our own pilot jobs just here in Alaska with our own people. So we definitely have a lot of people from out of state that get jobs here. They get jobs right after their commercial license or right at um, you know different minimums like 135 minimums or 121 minimums. So it just depends, you know? And, and at the end of the day, you just got to wherever you get hired, talk to those people, keep putting in your resume, updating your resume, um, meet them face to face if you possibly can. That is still such a huge thing in aviation is looking in someone's eye, giving them a, a firm handshake and talking to them about who you are in your career. At the end of the day, that's where the fit matters. A lot of the time, more than anything else is, are we going to get along with this person? Are they going to work in our, our small operation or in our airline? And that really, really matters still. And so it's kind of an old school way of doing it, but you still got to do it that way. And invariably, that's how I see it work for my friends right now that are getting jobs as they're moving up through their careers um, is they're, they're putting in the, the sweat equity with meeting people face to face and going to different gatherings and, and things where they can do that. So 
that really does go a long way. All right. Good question though. I like that question. Good question here. I like this one. Where and how to keep learning after private pilot license. And I want to broaden this and talk about um, talk about continual learning as a pilot anyway, because I think that the the sooner you can embrace the fact that you're always going to be learning as a pilot, the better off you'll be. And right now, you know, my life is pretty busy. Like I I don't have a ton of time to be in books at this very moment. Uh, I want to fix that. I want to figure out how to build time into my work schedule and my my family life and everything else to spend an hour a day or something in, in a new aviation book and do that. But I am still absorbing aviation content and learning things through, especially things like video, um, learning a whole lot there. So YouTube is a big one. Podcasts are a big one. I think that regardless of what you do, you have to tell yourself as a pilot that you're just going to keep learning and you're going to learn out of a general and genuine curiosity for the craft rather than just doing it because you have to or you should. Um, I really enjoy this aspect of aviation. It's one of the reasons I love being a pilot is that I'm learning more all the time. And so I'm huge on this. Uh, you know, I think that, uh, that, that, that being a lifelong learner in aviation is, is a fantastic thing. And I encourage you, whoever you are out there to, to do it yourself and, and just enjoy the process, learn something new, do something different. Um, get in on the conversations, find different instructors, uh, just, you know, there's so many different ways to do it, but just keep learning. No matter what you do, just keep learning. Okay. I did see this question about a medical and I want to find it because it was actually a very important question. Let me find it real quick. It might take me a second to pull it up. Okay, here it is. So flying at 50. Sounds like you're 50 years old and you're flying. Fantastic. Uh, we had someone earlier ask if they could get in the aviation at 35. So you are, you are the guy that, um, that says that we can. Okay. Um, how can you check in the status of your FAA medical after you sent them everything? So several different directions an FAA medical can go. The first off is you're a healthy person and it just goes really smooth and they hand you your medical at the office. That's going to be what happens most of the time. Uh, however, there are some of us that have, uh, that have things that come up where we need to, um, we need to work with the FAA more. We need to do more tests. We need to send in paperwork and they need to approve it on a different level. And so I had to do that too, especially initially to get what's called a special issuance medical. And what I would do when I initially went through that is I kept calling the FAA to figure it out. Now you can call the FAA and they can keep looking at it for you. But one of the best ways is to actually ask your doctor to look for an update because a lot of the times they keep it in the regional office and they can give you more information on it, okay? So talk to your doctor and the regional office, get the update, but you can also um, talk to the FAA, all right? So keep asking, call once a week. Um, I think that's a good pace and just keep asking about it. So Instagram is telling me I have one minute left, so I'm gonna have to close down the live stream here. They only allow an hour. This is the longest one I've done. I just kept, kinda kept going. But really appreciate you guys being here. Um, kind of to that thing about lifelong lear learning, I, I really appreciate those of you that are utilizing things like social media to further yourself as a, as a pilot and become a better pilot. If there's anything I can help you with in this process, please message me. A little interruption there. I try to uh, answer everyone back. And so yes, please message me and uh, I'd be happy to talk to you. Also, if you need ground school, online ground school, please come to me, support Angle of Attack. And if you have someone you need to recommend it to, you can recommend it to them as well. And we also have check ride preparation now with Check Ride Ace. 
Thanks for being here. Five seconds left. Until next time, throttle on.